Hello guys and welcome to The Little House on the Prairie Season 6 Review. It's the month of December. I can't believe it. It's the month of Christmas and the month that I, your reviewer of this series that I've been doing, it's birthday, December 27th. I will be 31. Hard to believe, I know. Um, so, I hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I know I did, and I wanted to get out this review because I have lots of things to do. It being the month of December, got to go Christmas shopping, got to wrap the presents and all that wonderful stuff. But I was able, the day after Thanksgiving, I found a bunch of videos on YouTube telling me some awesome historical facts that puts season 6 and season 5 way more in perspective than um, before. Just sort of like a way to tell us where we're supposed to be. Um, the YouTube video is called The Life and Legacy of Laura Ingalls Wilder. I might put it in the description. might do a link and put it in the description so you all can watch it yourselves. Um, because it had quite a few facts I did not know. And the woman did excessive research on it so that her facts are completely valid. Um, Alright, so. The Ingalls family settled in Walnut Grove in 1874. And... They did not have good luck. They were only there for two years. Okay, and if you have read The Little House on the Prairie series of books, On the Blanks of Plum Creek is what inspired Little House on the Prairie, not the book Little House on the Prairie. The book Little House on the Prairie was the pilot movie, not part of the series. So the, the third book in the series, On the Blanks of Plum Creek, is when they go to Walnut Grove, Minnesota. Now, if you finish that book and you go to On the Shores of Silver Lake, suddenly it feels like you have time jumped because suddenly Laura, Mary, Paul, Carrie, Baby Grace is now suddenly there and they're going to D. Smut in that book. And there's this big giant time jump and I was confused, which is why I went hunting for a video because I was confused about that. So I found this video and it cleared up a lot of things for me that I did not know. Okay, so the Ingalls family, like I said, came to Walnut Grove in 1874. Um, Laura was born in 1867, so she would have been... Um, I'm so not good at math on the spot, so let me look on my calculator. I'm so sorry for this. I had this all worked out, and then I forgot. She would have been about seven years old when they came to Walnut Grove. Now, they had the plague of locusts come down on the farm and they were unable to plant there. And I've learned that Charles Ingalls, although portrayed on the show as the, as the kind of person that, uh, you know, cash on the barrel, doesn't charge anything, Apparently, Charles was the type of person in real life to put the horse before the cart. I know the saying is, put the cart before the horse, but in, but in his case, basically, he would bank more on the horse than the cart. He would say, oh, don't worry, I'll be able to pay you back. Um, once this crop comes through, I'll be able to pay you back, I'll be able to do this, I'll be able to do that, and he would rank up bills and not be able to pay them. So, a plague of locusts came down, grasshoppers, and they ate everything green in sight. Um, they, um, and the Ingalls family was unable to get a crop out of this. 
Um, Charles had to walk about 300 miles, which was uh, portrayed in season one, to get some work for them to have some money. Um, and the plague of locusts didn't just come down and randomly leave. No, they laid eggs. Then they then there were the blizzards, and then there was a drought, and then there was a lot of rain, and then finally the eggs left over from the plague of locusts hatched, and this cycle started all over again. The family could not make it financially on the land in Walnut Grove that they had bought. So, Charles had a friend in town named Mr. Stran Stranton, who was going to Burr Oak, Iowa to open up a hotel. And he said that he would hire Charles to help him manage the place. Charles was under the impression this meant that they would have equal partnership but that was not to be the case. So the family went 100 miles away from Walnut Grove in 1875. And Charles Jr., whom they called Freddie, was born around that time and died nine months later in 1876. So Laura did not write about this time in her life because it was a horrible time. Apparently her daughter Rose Wilder wrote about it, but she refused because it was a very embarrassing and horrible time in her life. The Ingalls family moved to Burrow, Iowa in 1875 and stayed there for about a year. Um, down the street from the hotel was a saloon and the girls, Mary, Laura, Carrie, were exposed to prostitution, domestic violence, gun violence, anything you could think of that was going on in the 1800s, they were exposed to it because of because they've been in the country their whole lives. So they were exposed to a life they'd never ever dreamed they'd have. Not only did Ma have to be the cook and Paul have to be the manager, but the girls also had to be waitresses and serve the food. The Strantons treated the Ingalls family like servants and did not pay them enough. Paul ended up ranking up abundance of bills, and in 1877, um, or maybe 1876, I'm sorry, I'm not abundantly clear, Grace Ingalls was born um, in Burr Oak, Iowa. Now, it's often betrayed on the show that Charles Ingalls is the type of person that will make sure his debt is paid and everything. Well, the family ended up contact getting malaria again. They got it once um, when they were in Indian Territory, I think it was, and they almost died. But luckily for them, Jack was able to alert the neighbors and the doctor, a doctor saved them. Um, but Charles raked up a grocery bill, a doctor bill, abundance of bills that he did not have any money to pay. He, did, he could not get his own land and the Strattons were not very kind to the Ingalls family. So in the middle of the night, in the spring or summer of 1877, the Ingalls family skipped out in the middle of the night, leaving their debts behind them, which is fascinating to me. So they go back to Walnut Grove, but it's not the Walnut Grove they left behind. In season five, it's betrayed, it, they make it in the show like the Ingalls family comes back, they're able to get back in their house, and the town's completely abandoned and desiccated and everything, but that was not the case. See, the Strantons switched land with the Wilson family, who had built a hotel and saloon in the town of Walnut Grove. So Walnut Grove turned into Winoka, the fictional town on the show Winoka, and was like Borough, Iowa. And the Ingalls family was virtually homeless. They could not go back to their land because Charles again put the horse before the cart, thinking, oh, 
Mr. Stratton is my friend. I'm going to have all these profits because hotels are suddenly becoming popular and maybe I'll be able to have ownership in this hotel. He was wrong. Again, every single time he was wrong, putting the horse before the cart. Um, so the Ingalls family arrive in Walnut Grove. It is not the town they left. It's thriving. It's different. There are more people in there than there were before. Um, and the Ingalls family went from one house to the next, renting it, and never found their own stretch of land again. Was not able to get a crop going again. Was not able to have their own animals or their own farm or anything in between. Laura continued to be criticized by Nellie Owens, a.k.a. Nellie Olson, on the show, but in real life her name was Nellie Owens. The last name Olson was changed to, you know, not get the Owens family mad at her. Um, which I'm not sure if any of the Owens are still alive. I would like to look that up a little bit later and tell you. Um, so she also got criticized and bullied by the daughter of the owner of the hotel in town. I can't remember her name. Um, so the Ingalls family struggled from 1877 and 1878 and most of 1879. Um, in the winter, in the fall and the winter of 1879, Mary got sick. It was not scarlet fever. They're not entirely sure what it was, but Laura wrote it down in her book on the shores of Silver Lake as scarlet fever. Mary had, was prone to horrible migraines. She was hot all the time. They cut her hair off. Um, seeing if that would relieve the heat from her head, and she eventually became blind as a result of whatever this was. The family realized with Mary becoming blind, all their hopes and dreams that they had pinned on her were now null and void. Suddenly now, every single responsibility that Mary was going to carry is now on Laura's shoulders. Mary was going to become a teacher and get the family out of the out of financial ruin. Realizing that there was no more future in Walnut Grove, the family decided to leave at around the same time that Mary became blind. Charles was told from a friend in town that there was a job with the railroad in a town that was just starting up called Dee Smut, South Dakota. The Ingalls family packed up their stuff and went without a second thought because they Virtually at this point had nothing, except for probably Ma had her China doll. Um, so they packed up and they left. But unfortunately, there was nothing waiting for them in D. Smut, South Dakota. It was not a town. There were no buildings. Charles would be working for the railroad. And literally when you went into town, after you got off, got off the train, there was a hotel and everything. But as you went into the town of Desmut, there was nothing virtually there at all. Land was opened up as far as the eye could see for anyone to grab, but no one was there. The Ingalls family had to live in tents on on the side of the railroad tracks before they could they could get in a house. This happened the majority of 1880 during the spring and summer. It wasn't until the winter month of 1880 that Charles and his family were able to move into the settler's house, the guy who settled the town, which still sits there in the town to this day. Also, the hotel that Paul and Ma helped manage with the Strantons is still standing in Borough, Iowa as well. Um, so... Now, all of the hopes and dreams that they had for Mary is gone out the window. Mary has to go to the blind school, blind college, college sorry. Um, her education was free because she was blind, but they had to provide money for her clothes, for her uniform she had to wear, and transportation to and from school via train during, in the summer. And she was there for four years. Um, Laura and Carrie finished school in a neighboring town, and that is where Laura met 
Eliza Jane Wilder, Omanzo Wilder's sister. Laura did not like this woman. She found her to be snotty, and she went off on her when she tried to correct Carrie at some point. Um, but she finished her schooling and got her teaching degree in the spring of 1880. This, unfortunately, unlike in season six, is portrayed as being an awesome occasion and Laura is so excited when she finally becomes a teacher was not the case in real life. Laura was not becoming a teacher out of want, but out of necessity. She had to provide money for her family because they were in financial restraints. And it was through her teaching that they would be able to buy some land, some farming equipment, and build their own house. Of course, Charles was still working for the railroad, but it wasn't enough. Laura hated, detested being a teacher because she was young, inexperienced, the kids knew it, and they basically considered her unlistenable. Meaning, since she was young, as young as they were, um, they, they didn't have to listen to her. Um, there was a horrible winter in 1881 and 1882, and the Ingalls family almost froze to death in the settler's house because they still had not had their own house at that point. Eventually throughout the 1890s, Paul would build several buildings in town that still stand in D. Smut, hey, South sorry. Dakota, because camera cut me off. So, the buildings were built by Paul in the 1890s because the Ingalls family were the first people to settle in De Smut, South Dakota. And those buildings still stand to this very day in that town. Anyway, during the winter of 1881, the Ingalls family almost froze to death. But lucky for them, Omanza Wilder and his older brother Royal Wilder came to town due to the land opportunities in De Smut, and they went around checking on families to make sure they were okay. And one of the families they checked on and saved was the Ingalls family. But Laura was so delirious from hypothermia that she did not meet Omanzo at that point. Laura continued teaching throughout 1881 and 1882, and this is where she met Omanzo. The schoolhouse that she worked at was in a neighboring town because De Smut did not have its own schoolhouse at that point. Almanzo happened to be driving home and saw her and offered to take her home since he knew where she lived. She took his ride but told him that it was just that, a ride. There would be no romantic notions between the two of them. Famous last words. He continued driving her to and from her job till she quit in eight at the start or toward the end of 1883. He continued taking her places throughout 1883 and 84, but it all culminated in a very special event. One day he had taken her to the general store in the neighboring town to get food and such for her family. When he came to pick her up to take her home, there was a woman, another woman, in his wagon. Her name was Sheila Gilbert, and Laura basically told her, told him, it's either me or her. He obviously chose Laura, and the two began courting and dating throughout 1884, and eventually got married in August of that year. He was 23, she was 17. The first four years of their life was hell on earth. Omanzo had bought his own land, but he was also like Paul. He always put the horse before the cart. He did not inspect the land thoroughly before he bought it and found that there was no way to have water, running water on it, and there was not running water from a well. The, the wilders had to, had to put it in themselves. There were droughts, there were blizzards, there were treacherous things. Around 1885 or 1886, Rose Wilder was born and eventually an unnamed baby was born in 1886. Um, 
that Laura had a, that mysteriously died the day after he was born. And then the house caught on fire and burned to the ground. And that was the final straw. Also, before that, Laura and Omanzo got malaria again, and Omanzo became paralyzed from the waist down temporarily and had to be in a wheelchair. So, Laura sent Rose to live with her mother and her father in the house in Desmut, which at this point Paul had built, which would eventually be the home that he would die in in 1901. Um, her and Omanzo decided to try their luck in Florida. California, I mean. Um, they were there from 1887 to about 1888. Um, they found the time there to be horrible. They hated the climate. Laura thought the people were strange, weird, and they went back to Dee Smut, South Dakota, and lived with her mother and father and Mary and Carrie and Grace, if they were still there at that point, I don't know. Um, and eventually stayed there to 1891, and then they saw an advertisement in the paper telling them that there was farmland in the Ozarks, and they decided to go on a treacherous journey to figure out what they could do there. Um, and Laura did not want to write about that terrible time, but she kept a diary and eventually got published. Um, and that's all I know. I stopped the video right there because that's more than I wanted to know, and I find that to be interesting considering how they portray this in Season 6. Let's talk about Season 6, alright? Season 6 is obviously supposed to be the season that introduces Omanzo, but we have so many episodes that take so many different turns, and remember, you can point out the inconsistencies of something, but you can still love it, okay? So, hear me out. The first episode, first two-part episode, is Back to School Parts 1 and 2. This episode introduces Omanzo and his sister Eliza Jane Wilder coming to Walnut Grove so that she can be the new teacher. I don't know why Mrs. Garvey's not the teacher anymore, but she's not. Um, so, instantly when Laura meets Omanzo Wilder on the show, she falls head over heels in love with him and is carving their names on a tree before he even, like, shows any kind of interest in her, and it takes forever, believe me, um, for him to do so. Because when she first meets him, she's not 16, she's about 15 or 14, I think. So, knowing that in this season she turned 16, we're in 1883 pretty much at the end of the season. So roughly, we're in 1881, 1882, which at this point, like I said, they're not even supposed to be in Walnut Grove anymore. But that's okay. We can forgive that. Um, because like I said, they had to do it that way. Um, they had to keep one location. Um, so, um, it's also established in the first two-part episode that Nellie has her own restaurant and hotel, which Mrs. Olson has made for her to find a husband, specifically to find a husband. She makes this abundantly clear. Um, so why it seems to be a shock later on, I don't understand. Um, but Caroline is hired on as the cook, which is a job she'll keep throughout the rest of her time on the show, I believe. Um, and Mrs. Olson sees an opportunity with Almanzo for Nellie to have a husband. So she <laughs> um, sets them up on a date and Laura volunteers to make Omanzo's favorite dish, cinnamon chicken, which Laura substitutes with cayenne pepper, the hottest pepper ever. Allison talked about this scene and said that she could not gulp the water down fast enough and they had to do it in fi 15 different takes before she was able to do it. But it looks effortless to me, whatever take they used, I don't know. Um, but it's a hilarious episode, and after this episode, Nellie is not interested in, in Almanzo ever again. This episode also contains the famous mud fight, which Melissa Gilbert and Allison have talked about exclusively in interviews. There's at one point during the fight where 
Laura picks up a big wad of dirt and shoves it in Nellie's mouth. And the dirt wasn't just dirt, it was mud and it was cow poop. And so Allison had to eat cow poop. And that's how she found out she could eat anything without her stomach being upset, lucky girl. Um, so Little House on the Prairie did it first, guys. Before Dynasty or anyone else, they were fighting in the mud. Um, so after that, Mary and Adam are not in that episode. Um, then we get, we get the third episode of the season, which is the third miracle where Mary and Adam are going off to a neighboring town for Adam to do a speech on what he's been doing for the blind children. And he's trying to persuade Mary to do this speech. And as you know, this did not happen in real life. Um, they go on a coach because Laura and Albert happen to be for this episode only, um, doing getting honey from bees and selling them to Mr. Olson at the Mercantile. They trick Mr. Mrs. Olson into taking the beehive and the bees attack Nellie and Mrs. Olson when they're bringing them home. And from that, they're able to come up with enough money for them to go on the coach. The coach crashes, the driver dies instantly. Um, there's a pregnant woman on board played by Leslie Landon, Michael Landon's daughter in real life. And she is okay, but she goes into labor, so Mary, who is blind, has to go trudging through the wilderness to try to find help, and eventually Paul does save her, and it's called the third miracle because she happens to have her old glasses from the episode Four Eyes, which causes a fire to happen, and that's how Paul and Jonathan are able to find her. Awesome episode. Did not happen in real life, but awesome episode. Okay. So, the next episode after that, the circus comes to town, and we get a little background on Mr. Olson. His sister is the fat lady in the traveling circus, and the episode is titled Annabelle. This episode shows that Nellie is maturing quite nicely, because she's not making fun of the fat lady as much as Mrs. Olson is. And when Nels finally yells and says, she's my sister, knock it off, Nellie is the first one to stop. And then when Mr. Olson finally says, the fat lady is my sister, Annabelle, and I love her, Nellie is the first one to get up and start clapping. Like she's seen her father in a whole new light. So I think that's a sign of maturity. I could be wrong. I don't know. Considering what she does to Laura in back to school when Laura tries to uh, take the teaching exam and Nellie says there's no history on it. I mean, that whole thing was so dumb because why would you believe her, Laura? Just why? Um, so Mary and Adam briefly appear in that as seeing the circus, but really not much to do in that episode. Um, so then there's an episode called The Family Tree. They don't appear in that one. Um, where they have to make a family tree in school and Albert can't make a family tree because he doesn't know anything about his family and he asks Paul to officially adopt him. They do. They find his his Paul. His last name's actually Albert Quinn. And um, the father doesn't want him because, you know, he's his son. He wants him because um, to work on the farm. And Albert overhears this, pretends to be blind, so his father won't adopt him. Um, then we have... Sorry, got to look. An episode that I have never seen syndicated called The Preacher Takes a Wife um, where the Reverend Alden gets married and I did not know this because the woman literally does not appear in another episode beyond this episode in season six and I'm not even joking her name's Miss Craig not the same last name as mine unfortunately um, and Mrs. Olson we get a little background on her she apparently was supposed to be with a guy that was going to marry her, but chose the church instead. And the reason why she's so mean and opposed to the Reverend Alden getting married in this episode is because what he did to her. I mean, amazing episode. Great acting by Catherine McGovern. Um, the next episode after that, um, 
is the Halloween dream where Albert dreams that he is mistaken for the son of Sitting Bull. It's one of the most controversial and most talked about episodes of season six that most people in Little House on the Prairie fans do not like and I echo that because I could not get through it. I skipped it. And Mary apparently appears in that episode but she doesn't appear in The Preacher Takes a Life. Um, then we have um, The Return of Mr. Edwards. I have to see if I'm still, like, am I still recording? Yeah, I am. Sorry, had to see if I was still recording. Um, so in the last review, or in the review of season three, I said that Bonnie Barrett, who played Grace, made her last appearance in season three. I was wrong. She makes her final appearance in season six. I've never seen this episode of Mr. Edwards syndicated, and I think I know why. Um, in this episode, Mr. Edwards is working at what I think is a mill. It has something to do with trees, and a tree is about to fall on Alicia and he ends up running and knocking the tree or knocking her out of the way and the tree falls on him and he becomes paralyzed so it is a very like a good performance by Victor French but the character obviously recovers because he comes back, apparently, in season eight. I don't know exactly when or what episode. Um, but he tries to kill himself when they go hunting. And it is, like, graphically displayed that he's going to do this. Um, so I think that's why it's not syndicated. Because um, I've never seen it. I did not know that Grace made another appearance. It was a good episode. Great performances. For some reason, Carl's not in it. I don't know why. Um... Then after that, we're back, or half of the cast is missing in the next episode called The King is Dead, which is kind of like a rehashed version of The Fighter, um, only with not interesting characters, and I ended up skipping it. Then we had The Faith Healer. Mrs. Olsen invites a new reverend in town that can heal through the power of prayer, and he convinces everyone in Walnut Grove he can do this. There's this random guy in town who we just meet for this episode and never see again with his son who has an appendicitis and he tells him that he has successfully made it go away but the, joy, but the boy dies as a result. And he's a fraud in one of the best confrontations. So sorry, TV history. It cut me off again, don't worry. Um, Charles ends up confronting him um, because he realizes the same routine is happening where he uh, helps a woman to be able to walk again in a wheelchair, a blind woman to see again, and Mary does not appear in this episode. And you would think that she would because she could go all Miss Peel on that, bl on that fake blonde wo blind woman's ass. I mean, she could tell her off. Like, I'm telling you, she could tell her off. But unfortunately... Mary is nowhere to be seen in this episode, and the guy is presented as a fraud. It's, like, terrible. So then we get one of the most bizarre episodes, and that kind of, um, not as bad as, um, the Halloween Dream episode, but in my opinion, just as bad. It's called Arthur Arthur. Okay. Caroline is all excited because her parents are coming for a visit in Walnut Grove, but here's the thing. Her father died in real life when she was 11 years old. So at this point in the timeline on the show, this guy should not even be alive. But for some reason, they decide to keep him alive and have the mom die en route to, the, to see their daughter. We never get to see her. We don't know what she looks like. Charles just goes to the train station to pick them up, which I've noticed that every um, time they're on a train, it's number three every single time, but I guess that was like the only train they could use, but that's okay. Um, something I noticed. 
but she arrives in a coffin and literally before Charles and her father can tell her she goes in the back of the wagon to see her mother and and her mother's in a coffin yeah guys apparently there's a new location now um, on the left side of the church slash school there's now a graveyard that is suddenly there um, in the previous episode that I was talking about the faith healer they buried the boy that died of the appendix there and then they bury Caroline's mother there so it kind of shows up unexpectedly and I'm thinking there's not a lot of places there so is, is the kids playing on dead people when they're playing when you see them playing over there are they playing on people's graves or something it's so weird I know they didn't have a lot to work with but still you could have put them in a different location not like right there by the school slash church and then literally after this scene this guy is completely over his life's death and the next scene he's t telling stories about Caroline's childhood and it's like you know what the worst part is no one's gonna remember me no one's gonna remember my name or anything about me it's like um I'm sorry are you aware that your wife just died why are you being so selfish and thinking about yourself right now um but Charles is like well those stories you tell are so funny you should write a book um what yeah he didn't write a book again to refresh your memory he died when Caroline was 11. He did not write a book. But in this in this episode, he writes a book. And Charles sends it off to get published. And it gets published. Oh, oh, oh. And that's not the worst. Oh, no. That's not the worst. In this episode, Mary and Adam finally appear to being absent for three or four episodes in a row. And Mary is now nine months pregnant. What? Okay, and this is coming from someone who is watching them disc by disc, okay? Not on, on TV, because they don't have to show them in order on TV. This is in order. The way that they aired, uncut, the original, the way that they were. This is treated like a, like a subplot, like not even an important thing. It's like Laura runs into the blind school and says, Guess what, Mary and Adam? Um, Grandma and Grandpa, Ma's mom and dad are coming to visit us. And Mary, like, gets up and she's pregnant. And that's why I went on my Facebook group and was like, um, when did Mary get pregnant? Did I miss something? I even went back and watched the episodes again, even the dumb Halloween dream one, and there's no mention of her being pregnant. And I'm just like, uh. What is happening? You had a whole episode in season five where she had a miscarriage and now you actually give her a baby? There's this one hilarious scene where Mary wants some chicken that's downstairs and Adam goes to get it for her but she falls asleep and doesn't want it no more. And the end of the episode she has the baby and she names part of it after her grandfather. Um, Adam, Charles, Kendall, and whatever the grandfather's last name is, I don't remember. Not important. Um, so then after this episode, Walnut Grove gets its first telephone. Yeah. Um, and Mrs. Olsen becomes the switchboard, bo switchboard operator. <laughs> and of course this gives her a chance to listen in on people's calls. Um, and for some reason, I guess Jonathan Garvey is paid more at the mill than Charles is because he's able to afford a phone. He gets Mrs. Garvey a phone and she's over talking with her mother and Mrs. Olsen finds out that she was married before and Mr. Garvey is pissed. Um, he ends up going to like take a delivery that happens to be in the town that the mother lives in and the mother basically tells him that Alice's father died at a very young age and there was this man around that she considered like a father figure. When she got old enough she married him out of obligation not out of want or need because she still wanted that connection. But she found out that he was a compulsive gambler and they were only married for two weeks. 
Jonathan goes as far as to finding this guy, pretending to be someone else because he happens to be a bartender, and he talks about her, about Alice, and he t and he tells Jonathan, if you find somebody like that, who's wonderful, don't let her slip through your fingers like I did. Sorry, that was my phone. Probably an email or something coming in. I apologize. I should have silenced it. Um. So then after that, um, we have, oh, I'm so sorry. One more fun thing about that episode. Two fun things. The bank is back. Apparently it didn't survive before, but it's back and thriving and it's got its own phone. And, and uh, Mrs. Olsen overhears him. Albert cooks up a scheme to, to get back at Mrs. Olsen for spreading gossip about the Garveys. And uh, basically... Um, tells um, um, the owner of the bank, not Mr. Spray, he's gone, don't know what happened to him, but um, the new owner that to call his friend and say there's a bunch of stocks in the pharmaceutical company and Mrs. Olsen overhears this and decides to invest all her money in it, which unfortunately is not a good idea because it's a fake company. Um, and to get Nellie off the phone, who's also listening in on people's conversations, Oma, um, Albert throws a rat on, on her. So Mrs. Olson um, invests all her money and ends up losing it and also ends up losing her ownership in the mercantile. So anyway, the next episode has no stakes whatsoever. It's a character introduction episode like from season one, only less interesting. This boy is introduced, his father abuses him, his father gets killed on the docks because he owes money or something. Years later, he is sent to his grandparents in Walnut Grove, he hits his grandfather, he steals Charles's watch at a picnic, goes to Mankato and gambles it away, and Charles sends him to jail for stealing his watch then takes him home, makes him do farm work, and the boy is not all better by the end of the episode, and we never see him again. So there you go. Um, the next episode after that is... The Werewolf of Walnut Grove. A new character, a bully, gets introduced named Bartholomew, who comes to school and is older than the other kids. He starts being mean to everyone, especially Albert and Laura. And Omanzo's back, guys! Did you forget Omanzo was in this show? Because I sure the hell did. The last appearance he made was in Annabelle. Um, and he was going out with some other girl and Laura sabotaged her dress and threw water on her when she was dressed up like a clown and kissed Omanzo on the, on, on the lips. But no one knew it was her but Ma. Um, and Omanzo... This is the first time he's appeared since then, and he ends up breaking up a fight between Albert, Laura, and Bartholomew. Eventually, Albert gets an idea of making a paper mache head of a werewolf and scaring Bartholomew into being nice to Miss Wilder so that she doesn't have to go away, so Laura won't, won't, uh, so Almanzo won't have to leave. And, uh, it almost works, but Carrie messes it up. But... You have to be a bully to beat a bully. Not a good lesson. Don't ever do this. Um, where they just pile on Bartholomew and beat him up until he basically says he's sorry to, to Miss Wilder and we never see him again. Then there's whatever happened to the class of 57 or 56 where Caroline and Charles go to their high school reunion and everyone has moved up in the world but them and they also run into the old their old boyfriend and girlfriends, and this is what I have to say about that episode. Try not to think about what might have been, cause that was then, and we had to take a different road. We can't go back again, there's no use giving in, and there's no way to know what might have been. Pretty much because the simple fact of the matter is there's no stakes. We already know who they married and what happened, so there you go. Um, then we have Mary and Adam 
are back in Darkness is My Friend. Adam, Esther Sue, Ma, Reverend Alden, um, Mrs. Olson, and a few other people decide to go off to a neighboring town to ask a board of directors to give money to the blind school. Meanwhile, Laura decides to stay overnight at the blind school with Mary at the same time that three criminals end up escaping off of the train and coming to the blind school and holding Mary and Laura and the blind children, as well as Mary's son, hostage. They send Laura out to go help their friend who's been shot in the leg, and Laura can't find Paul, or can't find Doc Baker. So she runs and gets Paul, who's happy to get away because Albert tried to make dinner and it didn't turn out so well. Um, and she brings him back to Walnut, or back to the blind school, and he pretends to be Doc Baker. But Charles broke into Doc Baker's uh, office, slash, I think he lives their house, I'm not sure, um, and gets his medical bag, so Doc Baker goes up to the blind school because Laura had went looking for Doc Baker at Mr. Olson's house, and Nellie was there practicing her singing, which is terrible. <laughs> and um, he goes up to the blind school, and all hell breaks loose when he knocks on the door. Charles is able to knock out one guy and knock out another before he ends up accidentally getting shot, but apparently he lives. And um, is able to save Mary before the third guy almost hurts her. And it turns out they couldn't get any money for the blind school, but it turns out that the capture of the three criminals gave them all kinds of all the money they need. Yay! In the next episode, Silent Promises, which is one I would skip because there's no stakes whatsoever and has nothing to do with the storyline as a whole, Laura teaches a deaf kid um, sign language and he falls in love with her and she doesn't know what to do. Um, but if you was to skip that episode and go to the most controversial, debated episode in the history of Little House on the Prairie, may we make them proud, the story picks up exactly where Darkness is My Friend left off. They're now using the money that they earned from capturing the criminals in that episode to paint the blind school, to put additions on it. And Albert, oh Albert, who is not real and was not a real person in the Ingalls family's lives, was made up specifically for the show despite briefly smoking a pipe in season five and not liking it when Ma and Pa went away to go to Adam and Mary's wedding in, w in Winoka, decides to go down to um, the basement and try to smoke some other man's pipe. And again, the same situation happens. When Esther Sue comes down to tell the boys the dessert is ready, they leave the pipe in a box of old rags, and slowly but surely, those rags catch on fire. And other things around those rags continue to catch fire throughout the rest of the day. It isn't until all the blind children are tucked into bed that the most controversial storyline begins. According to Melissa Gilbert in her memoir, A Prairie Tale, this episode was done specifically for ratings. And Alice, the actor that played Alice, wanted out of her contract, but NBC would not let her. So, Michael Landon said, well, they can't make you stay on the show if you're dead. So he decided to kill her off and kill Mary and Adam's baby off since technically it didn't exist in the first place. So there's a lot of mistakes in this episode that really pissed me off. Mistake number one. Esther Sue sees smoke coming from the basement door. She opens it and does not close it back when the fire comes in, causing the fire to spread from down there to more parts of the house. Mistake number two. Adam, when he finds out there's a fire, goes up, grabs Mary, and says we have to get the blind children out, but none of them get grab the baby. Mistake number three. They get all the children out and still don't go back for the baby. Mistake number four. 
Alice goes to get the baby and hears one of the blind children who was snoring and went in to blow his nose so he won't snore and gets locked in the bathroom. Oh, sorry, cut me off again. Call. This will be the last video, I swear. So mistake number five, like he's calling for help. She does not take the baby with her to go get this kid out of the bathroom. She gets him out and she helps him downstairs. She doesn't stop, go in the room and get the baby and then they all three go down the stairs. No, she lets him go down the stairs and run out the door. Mistake number six and finally mistake number seven. She grabs the baby and suddenly there's a bunch of flames all around her and instead of running through the flames and running down the stairs as fast as she can to save the baby, she uses the baby as a battering ram to bust open the window. She uses the baby to break the window to call for help. Oh. My. God. Why? Seriously. Why? According to Melissa Gilbert's memoir, A Prairie Tale, I'm not sure if I said that in the last video, I'm sorry, um, if I did, um, this episode was a two hour special and it was done specifically for ratings. NBC wanted more dramatic episodes. And the actress that played Alice wanted out of her contract. Um, and unfortunately, NBC would not let her out. And Michael Landon said, hey, they can't make you stay on the show if I kill you on the show. So that's what he did. And he decided to kill Mary's baby too, since it technically didn't exist. This really makes me mad with everything. Sorry, rant coming. It'll be a short one, I promise. With everything that we know about Mary, the fact that she was sick all the time, the fact that she never had children, and the fact that she never had a husband, and that they do this to her, makes absolutely no sense to me. Why give her a miscarriage? And she didn't have a baby. Why have her carry a baby to term and then kill the baby in a fire? Why? 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 It is so wrong. Why make her life more tragic on the show than it was in real life? I always thought, hey, they made it better. No, they didn't. And then you want to know, you want to know what is the worst thing the worst thing is, well, the whole episode is the worst thing, but the worst thing overall is after that, they go back to the Laura and Omanzo love story as if the freaking blind school didn't burn down. And the next episode, simply titled, um, uh, oh wait, no. And the next episode, simply titled Wilder and Wilder. Omanzo's older brother Royal comes into town and Charles sees this as an opportunity to set her up with his younger brother, which is supposed to be his older brother in real life. Ugh. But um, through getting to know Royal, Charles realizes that Omanzo is the mature one and softens towards Omanzo. Then we have an episode called Second Spring, which is really boring. Mr. Olsen decides to go off away from Mrs. Olsen for a while and almost contemplates having an affair with Maggie from Days of Our Lives. It's a boring episode and apparently it was written because Michael Landon had an affair with the makeup artist on the show and left his wife. I don't really know the details. Um, but apparently it was written for that specific reason. Um, so then after that, on the disc, like when it tells you what episodes are on the disc, of season six, it says, Sweet 16, then he loves me, he loves me not, parts one and two. But apparently when you put the disc in your DVD player, it has Sweet 16 in the middle of parts one and two of he loves me, he loves me not. Making it not in order. I don't know why they did that. Um, but I watched it in the order. In Sweet 16, Laura becomes 16, which is 1883 in the timeline. That's where we are. And her and Almanzo realize they love each other. And she gets that terrible flower, red flower dress that she wears throughout the rest of the show. And Melissa Gilbert said she hated that dress. She had them burn it when it was finally time to leave because she was like, I always had to wear that dress. She said, I hated it. She said, at least when I was in pigtails and everything, I had different little dresses I wore, but 
I wore that flower dress way too much. And I agree. So, none of he loves me, he loves me not. Um, Laura, they finally realized that Mary and Adam, the blind school burned down and they lost their child. And Mary went through a lot of shit in that episode. Apparently, Melissa Sue Anderson's performance got an Emmy, and she didn't win again. Nomination, and she didn't win again. And it got her cast in one of my all-time favorite cult classic horror films, Happy Birthday to Me, where she starred in it and said a lot of cuss words that she never got to say on Little House. Like, she called people bitches. It was interesting to hear that word come out of her mouth. Um, Little Mary Ingalls calling, pe calling someone a bitch. But anyway, um... They are, Adam's father dies and he left a lot of debt behind so there's not enough money to pay for the blind school. But luckily, with Laura's teaching job, she's able to get the money for this this uh, abandoned old courthouse in Sleepy Eyed and gets that. Omanzo then decides to work um, more and till he gets pneumonia and Laura and him fall in love and Nellie ends up falling in love with Percival, a wonderful, wonderful character um, and a wonderful actor that unfortunately passed away in 1986 due to the AIDS virus. And he was a phenomenal actor and Allison loved working with him. His name was Steve. Um, I don't remember his last name. I'll tell you in the next review. I'm, I apologize um, for that. But he was such a great addition to the show. Um, him and Allison's chemistry is like off of the off the charts. If they did a wonderful story arc with them, with their relationship, like they did their relationship with Laura and Almanzo, it would have been far more intriguing. Um, but they Nellie and Percival end up getting married because he comes to town to teach her the restaurant business and she falls in love with him after he throws eggs on her and says a girl as pretty as you should be hard to find a husband. Um, and they get married and, and Paul tells Omanzo and Laura that they have to wait one year when she turns 18, even though she got married when she was 17, but okay. Um, and that's the season, guys. That's it. Um, and it's amazing to me. At the start of season five, we are in a different location. And at the end of season five, they have anthrax. And they're helping a child go see the ocean who has leukemia. And this season, we start off with Laura and Almanzo meeting each other for the first time. We veer off in blind schools catching on fire, criminals taking Mary and Laura hostage before the blind school catches on fire. We have a stupid fighter episode and all these other episodes that have nothing to do with anything. And then at the end of the season, we're back to Amonzo and Laura. I can't wait to see what happens in season seven because I have not seen every single episode. And I'm curious to see what happens next. Um, like I said before, I hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I hope you are wearing your masks and staying safe during this terrible time. I hope that you enjoyed all the historical facts that I um, put in this review. It took a long time um, to watch that video and to understand everything and verify everything, so that's why it took me a while to do this review. I find all of that to be fascinating. Um, so I'm going to try to watch season 7 this weekend and get the review out, but no promises because it's the month of December and I have lots of things that I got to do, you know, for Christmas and stuff. Um, so. I hope that you all enjoyed this review as much as I enjoyed. I want to say that I'm very thankful for everyone in our Facebook group who have encouraged me to continue doing these reviews, especially my best friend Betty, who also loves these reviews. I love Little House on the Prairie. Every time I watch it, I feel like I'm transported back in time to a simpler time. And I'll see you in the next review. And remember what Laura said, home is the nicest word there is. Happy Holidays, Merry Christmas, and I hope everyone enjoys themselves and stay positive and be thankful for what you have. Have a great day. Have a great night whenever you watch this and thanks for watching. Oh, and if you enjoy my videos, please subscribe to my channel so that's when you will know when the new review comes up. But I will still post it in our Facebook group. Thank you and bye!